Welcome back to Biographics. I'm your host, cosmic horror madman Eric Malachite, and today we're digging into the alleged story behind one of the most famous horror films of all time. And I guess I'll start today's video off by asking you all if you've ever had a paranormal experience. Stick to the end of the video and I'll share one of mine, and you can tell me in the comments whether you believe me or not. But drop your stories down below in the comments and get ready to dive into the terrifying story of Ronald Hunkler. On May 10th, 2020, a former NASA engineer named Ronald Hunkler died from a stroke a month before his 86th birthday. After his passing, he was mainly remembered for his contributions to space exploration, including work on the Apollo space missions and even a patent on a technology that helped panels withstand extreme heat. Then, about a year later, a magazine expose revealed the bizarre, sinister, and unique experience that Hunkler endured when he was a boy, one which he kept private during his adult life. In his youth, Hunkler was better known under the pseudonym Ronald Doe, a 14-year-old boy who was believed to be possessed by the devil and underwent several exorcisms. His case, although it did not make any major national waves, still got mentioned in a few newspapers, including one small piece in the Washington Post, which was seen by a student attending Georgetown University by the name of William Peter Blatty. For whatever reason, the story stuck with Blatty, and two decades later, it inspired him to write a horror novel, which then got turned into a movie that changed cinema forever, The Exorcist. As we said, up until 2021, the true identity of Ronald Doe was kept hidden from most of the world. So, people who looked into the case only had the original reports to go on and the diary entries of one of the priests involved in the exorcisms, named Raymond Bishop. Those who investigated following the reveal of Ronald Hunkler discovered that other things had been changed apart from the name. So they basically had to start from scratch to see what was true and what was not. Ronald Edwin Hunkler was born on June 1st, 1935 to a German Lutheran family, but not in the city of Mount Rainier, Maryland, as originally stated, but in the nearby town of Cottage City. We're not sure who his real parents were, although we should point out that Hunkler was sometimes also named using the pseudonym Robbie Mannheim, and his parents were presented as Carl and Phyllis Mannheim. So we're going to stick with that set of names since it's the only full set that we really have, if that makes any sense. We think it's less confusing than using Ronald Hunkler's real name and then pseudonyms for everyone else, especially since most items written about him before 2021 call him Robbie. Anyway, as far as we can tell, Robbie's childhood was fairly normal and unremarkable. The one outlier was his aunt Harriet, who had a thing for spiritualism and even gave her nephew his first Ouija board and, get this, explained to him that it could be be used to contact the spirits of the dead. And then Aunt Harriet died and the weird stuff started to happen. Things kicked off on January 15th, 1949. It was Saturday, so the parents went out for the evening, leaving Robbie, who was 13 at the time, at home with his grandma, Wagner. While they were out, the boy and his grandmother kept hearing a dripping sound, although they were unable to find its source. By the time the parents came back, the dripping had stopped, only to be replaced by the sound of scratching, like claws against the wooden floors. Everyone assumed it was a mouse or a rat under the floorboards, but when they called for an exterminator, he couldn't find any traces of a rodent in the house. A little weird, perhaps, but hardly cause for alarm just yet. Unbeknownst to his parents, Robbie had been using the Ouija board to contact his dead aunt. We can't say whether the call made it through or not, but Aunt Harriet was the one who got the blame for the things that would happen from then out. The clawing sound soon turned into footstep noises, specifically squeaking shoes, which made Phyllis Mannheim think that Harriet was the one causing all the shenanigans. After that, it was fairly standard haunted house stuff. Loud knocks, furniture getting tipped over, objects flying across the room, and all of it was happening when Robbie was around. Nothing dangerous yet, though. The house didn't implode like at the end of Poltergeist, but it was the kind of thing that made you think a professional might be required. The question was, though, which professional? When you have a leak, you call a plumber. When you have ants, you call an exterminator. But when it comes to possible paranormal activity, including spooks, specters, and ghosts, who are you gonna call? We all know the answer to that, but those guys weren't around just yet. So instead, the Mannheims called everyone else, a physician, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a psychic, and a priest. 
The first three seemingly didn't leave behind any records of their findings, apart from the psychiatrist reporting that the phenomenon was not genuine and that Robbie was just a normal kid. The physician found no physical problems with the boy, while the psychologist took Robbie to a mental health clinic where he performed tests to gauge his IQ, his memory, his imagination, and things like that for any kind of developmental problems. The psychic also said that nothing could be done, so that just left the priest, Lutheran Reverend Luther Miles Schultz, as the Lutheran Schultz did not believe in exorcism, so instead he organized a few prayer circles to help Robbie. He also encouraged psychiatric help since he too harbored suspicions that the kid could simply be pulling pranks instead of anything more sinister. But as the events in the house became more intense, he saw Robbie's parents reach the end of their tether, so he suggested that Robbie spend the night in his home. There, the same strange occurrences took place. Robbie's bed shook violently during the night, some furniture tipped over, and most disturbing scratches appeared on his body. The experience convinced Schultz that some unconventional assistance might be necessary, and he had something in mind. Although Schultz hopped aboard the exorcism train, so to speak, as a Lutheran, he was still in no position to conduct one. So he sent the Mannheims to a Roman Catholic priest named Edward Hughes. While all of Robbie's story can be viewed through a lens of skepticism, his time with Father Hughes is especially tricky since almost none of it can be corroborated. Hughes and his helpers kept no records, and all information came from second- and third-hand sources. But going by the standard version of events, Hughes checked Robbie into Georgetown Hospital sometime in late February 1949, under an assumed name. And after receiving permission from the Archbishop, he tried performing the first exorcism. During the act, the bed kept moving around the room, and scratches appeared on Robbie's body as the boys started speaking in an unknown language. The priest was engaged in prayer when Robbie somehow managed to slip one hand out of his restraints and grab a piece of loose bedspring. He slashed at Father Hughes's left arm, causing a long gash from shoulder to wrist. This put a premature end to the exorcism, and the experience disturbed Father Hughes so much that he had a breakdown and moved to another city. Again, none of this has ever been confirmed, and in some versions of the story, this exorcism never even took place. Robbie only went to Georgetown for some medical tests. Either way, Hughes couldn't help the boy, so his parents traveled to St. Louis, Missouri, where they were introduced to a Jesuit father named Raymond Bishop, who taught at St. Louis University's Department of Education and had heard of Robbie's problem. In turn, he enlisted the help of William Bodern, an experienced pastor and former World War II veteran. With permission from the Archbishop, the two of them decided to exercise Robbie Mannheim. The ordeal lasted about a month, from March to April 1949, during which Bodern and Bishop performed over 20 exorcisms with assistance from three or four other priests. They changed locations from the house where the Mannheims were staying to the Alexian Brothers Hotel, the Rectory of College Church, and the Jesuits' White House Retreat Center. But the other worldly phenomena seemed to follow wherever Robbie traveled. Father Bishop wrote about the experience in his diary, so we'll let him describe it. The prayers of the exorcism were continued, and R was seized violently, so he began to struggle with his pillow and the bed clothing. The arms, legs, and head of R had to be held by three men. The contortions revealed physical strength beyond natural power. R spit at the faces of those who held him and at those who prayed over him. He spit at the relics and at the priest's hands. He writhed under the sprinkling of holy water. He fought and screamed in a diabolical high-pitched voice. On other occasions, Bishop wrote that Robbie spoke in tongues, punched and broke the nose of a priest called Holleran, and had the word hell appear on his chest in red, bloody flecked lines. The boy even tried to kill himself once by jumping off a cliff, but he was tackled to the ground by Holleran before taking the plunge. The torment ended on Easter Monday, April 18, 1949. During that day's exorcism, Robbie began speaking with a wicked voice claiming to be the demon who was possessing him, warning the priests that he would never leave the boy. But later that night, the voice changed again, this time to that of an adult male, purporting himself to be Saint Michael, there to cast the demon out forever. Something which he did with ease, apparently. Because mere moments later, after a few screams and proclamations, Robbie returned to his regular self and simply said, He's gone. And that was that. 
the Archdiocese of St. Louis received an official report on the exorcism which it tucked away in its archives and never discussed the matter again. The Lutheran Reverend Schultz talked about the incident a few times, enough for someone to publish a small article that inspired William Peter Blatty to revolutionize the world of horror fiction. But that was the end of the boy known as Robbie Mannheim, and from then on, Ronald Hunkler was free to live a normal life again. He got married, had kids, and stayed out of trouble, and, as we previously mentioned, he worked as a NASA engineer for 40 years, which I think is way cooler than anything in this story. He did go through some anxiety after The Exorcist became a major hit, worried that people would start digging into his past, and his neighbors or co-workers might find out about his childhood experience. Some believe that the demonic possession and exorcisms of Robbie Mannheim were genuine, others that they were simply the work of a disturbed child. But what about Ronald? Although Hunkler himself never went on record to discuss the events, one anonymous friend did come forward and said that Ronald confessed to him that he made the whole thing up. In Hunkler's words, he wasn't possessed, he was just a bad boy. But what do you think? Was Ronald telling the truth? Comment below and let me know. Anyway, if you dug this video, be sure to do all that algorithmic jazz and let me know what you think those disembodied footsteps really were, and be sure to keep it tuned to Biographics for more videos like this. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time, Space Cowboy. Oh, right, I promised to tell my own story, didn't I? Alright, so keep in mind this is a condensed version of this story, but when my friends and I were just out of high school, and we all fancied ourselves to be amateur paranormal investigators because, you know, why not? One of my friends, I won't name names, told me about a road up near Paris, California called Santa Rosa Mine Road. We all decided to drive up there for the night. We thought it would be a good time, so we brought a case of beer with us too, as one does. The road was quite dark, mostly just hills and old homes and lots of trees and overgrowth. It was probably about as rural as a road can get in Southern California. In the middle of the night, we pulled off on the side of the road in a dirt patch near some tall grass. My friend who suggested coming out here told us some tall tales about an abandoned house, a creature he saw running in the hills, and swore that it was all true. We started as most idiots do and started taunting whatever might have been there. You know, we, we were stupid. We were like 18, 19 years old. None of us really believed we'd find anything. But oddly enough, we started hearing things in the tall grass, something that sounded like it was walking through the grass, but it didn't sound like an animal like some of us were suggesting. It sounded like footsteps. This was pretty interesting, so we kept taunting, even insulting whatever spirits were there. Sure enough, we started to hear footsteps all around us, even on the road, and I'll add, several feet from us. This spooked us pretty bad, and we jumped back in the car and drove off. I swore, and I still remember, I could hear something running after the car as we pulled away, like the footsteps got more intense as we drove off. To keep this short, we revisited Santa Rosa Mine Road many times. Each time, we heard those footsteps felt like we were being watched, and there were other strange things, believe me, I, I don't have time to get into them though. I don't know what it was that we heard. I don't know if they were ghosts or anything else really. It's possible there is some other earthly explanation for the sounds we all heard, but it was certainly an interesting experience, one that helped inspire some of the horror stories that became the foundation for my writing career. 